So far we've covered discriminative generative models for classification and for example saw that if we model the class conditionals with Gaussians uh, we end up with linear decision boundaries. And this is actually quite similar in, in a way to what we've seen in a pro probabilistic regression case where our solutions could also be obtained by formulating uh, a least squares regression problem uh, for which I do not necessarily need a probabilistic viewpoint. And also now we can decide to step away from the probabilistic viewpoint for a moment and try to directly model uh, the discriminative function without defining first a probabilistic model. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we will talk about discriminative models and directly define our uh, discriminative models. Now the setting is as follows. We have input vectors, uh, d-dimensional input vectors and corresponding targets. And we're considering the case of two classes. Okay, and then it's uh, numerically convenient and also well, computationally actually uh, to encode these targets um, with numerical values. So we are going to say that the target is either minus one or this one. And actually we saw before that we chose either zero or one. Um, sometimes one of the encodings is more convenient than others, but now let's stick with the minus one uh, encoding of these targets. Okay, then we're going to uh, define a direct mapping from uh, the input to the corresponding target via a discriminant functions, actually via something what we call generalized linear models. Now these generalized linear models uh, consist of this linear component, so it's linear with respect to W, uh, but maybe first we want to uh, compute some feature vector for each input X, right? So we're going to use basis functions. Um, but this model we saw before is in essence uh, linear with respect to W. And then once we've done that, we pull it through what we call an activation function. And that gives me my uh, prediction, my output. So this F will be called an activation function. Activation function. Uh, this particular part is linear. So it's not necessarily linear with X because we first compute some feature vectors, but once we've expanded this in this feature vector, um, the mapping is linear. And this then in the end defines a mapping from X to a corresponding target, uh, which is nonlinear. Okay, and, and in that sense, it's a generalized linear model because we have this linear model, but then we also uh, pull it through this uh, activation function. Okay, now uh, in this setting, the decision boundaries, in this setting, the decision boundaries um, are obtained by setting constant uh, this function value, right? And that in the end leads to uh, the fact that actually my decision boundaries are determined via this linear model. So let's say uh, we call this constant one, this constant two. So there's an equivalent constant uh, which defines this decision boundary in this setting. Okay, so really with these generalized linear models, we obtain again, linear uh, decision boundaries. Now I want to remark that actually also in a probabilistic setting, uh, the term generalized linear model has a special meaning. In, in this probabilistic setting, um, we call models of the following form only a generalized linear model if this activation function maps uh, my input to a corresponding expectation for the predictive distribution, which it would uh, encode. But maybe that's a detail that is not too important now. Uh, here we fo focus on discriminant function and completely discard the idea of uh, probabilities. And in that respect, I could choose this activation function to be whatever I want to be. And typically we choose activation functions in such a way such that it sort of fits our problem and that we can maybe define useful error functions uh, with it that we uh, can then later on uh, minimize. Okay, so generalized linear models lead to uh, linear decision boundaries. Now let's have a look at a very simple version of a generalized linear model. Um, so we really take a simple choice. We're going to say that the activation function is going to be the identity. So really I'm not activating anything. I'm just passing uh, the information through. And I'm also going to work with a uh, the standard canonical uh, basis. Basically meaning, um, well, my feature vectors are really the components in my vector, but I prepend it uh, with a one. 
right? So we stick to this form. Activation function is this identity, and my basis function is just uh, the vector, uh, my input vector prepended with a one. So W with this vector gives me then this linear form, which we have seen um, so many times already. Okay, so my discriminant function really is this uh, linear model over here. And I'm going to say that the decision boundary lies at the point where this, fun this function equals zero. I'm considering two classes here. So that's visualized over here. This is then the decision uh, boundary corresponding to some W and uh, this bias W zero. And if uh, I'm on this side of the decision boundary, so if Y is bigger than zero, then I'm going to assign it to class one. If it's lower than zero, I'm going to assign it to uh, class two. Okay, so this decision boundary is really given by W transpose X plus W zero is zero. This describes a per, uh, decision boundary. And while well, you may be familiar with these kind of equations, this, this type of equations really describe hyperplanes, right? Where this uh, W determines uh, the direction or the normal of this hyperplane. And this W0 really defines the intercept, the places where it crosses uh, the axis. Now, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to try to get some more intuition on what these components in a linear model mean. And um, we're going to start with um, this W vector. So what does it mean? Um, so first of all, let's just pick two points and we place them on the decision boundary. So I have a point XA over here and I have another point XB. Well, I place them on the decision boundary. So that means if I evaluate them in my discriminant function that they should evaluate uh, to zero. So that's what I know. Okay, so now let's take a look at this direction vector. So this is really, let's place that origin. So this vector is really XA minus xb, right? Then this identity gives me that w transpose with xa minus xb is going to zero, is going to be zero. So this really means that w is orthogonal to this vector xa minus xb, right? Okay, and that this inner product is zero follows from uh, this and, well, the description of my uh, discriminant function. Okay, so what does it tell, tell us? So this really says that if I take such a direction within my uh, plane uh, and I take the inner product with W, that this is zero. So this, this essentially means that W determines the orientation of the decision boundary. Um, so let me write it down. All right, so W determines the orientation of the decision boundary. Of course, we already knew that uh, from this uh, hyperplane parameterization, but this is just to gain some intuition. Uh, so if this direction would uh, rotate, would change, then that actually means that the direction vector W also changed its orientation. Um, okay, so we determined the role of W in this uh, discriminant uh, function. Now let's take a closer look at what this bias term actually uh, does. Can we give some extra extra interpretation to this thing? Now let's consider some point x prime. Let's put it over here. So this is going to be x prime. And what we're interested in is this distance from this point on this hyperplane to uh, the origin. So we're going to be interested in di this distance for now. We place this point on the, the decision surface. So that means y of x prime is zero. And then let's take a look at the distance of this point uh, to the surface. How can we obtain this? We can obtain this via an orthogonal projection. So this x prime is a, is a vector. So let's draw it with this red line over here. And now we want to project it onto uh, this green uh, w uh, direction. Okay, so this projection is computed over here, right? So we have a normalized vector w that de de determines this normalized vector over here. And if we take an inner product with x, that may basically means we project a point x onto this uh, vector. Same for this x prime, it will project this onto this, uh, well, to this point actually. Now, before I continue, I'm going to remark actually that uh, it lies on the surface. So that means that w transpose x prime plus w naught is zero. So that actually means that this inner product w uh, with x prime is going to be minus uh, 
w uh, zero. Okay, so and let's just put the primes over there. So this actually means that the distance of this surface to the origin is given by minus w zero over normalized uh, the norm of w. Okay, so what does this tell us? This tells us that w shifts the boundary away from the origin. Okay, so let me write this down. So, Okay, that's a nice interpretation. So W shifts the boundary away from the origin. Now, can we also give some interpretation on the actual value Y of X? So does this take on a particular meaning? Um, well, the answer is yes, of course. Uh, we can give some interpretation and we're going to do that by now, by now selecting just some general point X. So it's denoted over here. It's just some point X, uh, which does not lie on the boundary. And then we can evaluate Y of X for this point and we're going to give interpretation to it. Now what we can do, we're going to decompose this point X into the sum of a point that lies on my decision uh, surface plus this other component which lies in the direction of W. Okay, so I'm going to say that this X is the sum of X, well, projected on the, the hyperplane plus um, some distance R along the direction of the normal of the hyperplane, where this distance is going to be r. Okay, so I'm considering this point x, and I'm going to say it's going to be the, the sum of this factor, so x orthogonal or x on the hyper uh, surface, plus this factor, which is the component into the direct, in the direction of w. Okay, so that's written over here. We make this decomposition of x. Now, um, what we can compute, so now we're actually going to compute y of x and going to see if we can give some meaning to this thing. So y of x is given by this uh, linear model and I'm going to insert this expression for x uh, in here. So that gives me uh, the following. Okay, so where we have uh, this component because of the x on the hyperplane plus uh, the bias, so this actually equals, uh, together it equals y of x orthogonal. And this has to be zero, right? Because it lies on the hyperplane. So that actually means that I can get rid of these uh, two terms. So these two terms uh, together will be zero. And what I'm left with is this thing over here. So r times this thing. And what I'm seeing here is, um, well, in the numerator, we actually see the norm of W squared. And then in uh, the denominator, we also have the norm of W. So this is actually equal to the norm of W. Okay, so we can see that Y of X can be written in the form of R times the norm of W. And R was really the distance of my point X to uh, the hyperplane, right? So this means that R so for, from this equation, we can read out that R is given by Y of X divided by the norm of W. Okay, nice. So this tells us that uh, Y of X really determines the distance to the surface. So let me also write this one down. So, okay, great. So we now also gave interpretation to Y of X itself. So all in all, in summary, so we have uh, that W, uh, W defines the orientation of my hyperplane, uh, W naught, so this bias term really determines uh, the distance um, from this hyper, of this hyperplane to the origin. So with the larger W, it shifts away from the origin. And finally, Y of X in itself, if I evaluate Y of X, it tells me something about uh, the distance of my point X to this uh, decision plane. Okay, now a final remark on these discriminant functions. These discriminant functions, uh, which are linear functions of the following form, can also be applied in a multi-class uh, classification setting. And we can do so by uh, whenever we observe a new data point X, we can evaluate these discriminant functions uh, for all the classes. And we assign this X to class CK if uh, the discriminant function for class K Evaluate that x is larger than all of the other um, evaluations. 
for j, the class is j, basically for all j unequal to k. And essentially it says I'm going to pick uh, the class for which the distance of this point to the decision region uh, that is described by this uh, discriminant function is largest. Okay, then also here these discriminant functions describe uh, the decision boundaries between two classification regions um, via um, the locations where yk of x equals yj of x. And that gives me these uh, decision boundaries. And these decision boundaries are linear because the discriminant functions are linear. And we can quickly show that. So this equation really means wk transpose x plus wk naught is going to be wj transpose x plus wj naught. So these were vectors. Okay, so uh, we have linear decision boundaries because this expression only depends on x, right? I can move this to the left and then I get a, expression, a linear expression for this uh, decision boundary. Okay, and then finally a nice property of uh, generalized linear models is that the decision regions, so these regions are i, are j, are k, are convex. And this means that if I take two points within one region, so let's say xa and xb, then every point on the line that uh, connects these two points also belongs to this class. Now this is an interesting property that may be useful when you're going to do more analysis of the behavior of these type of classifiers. Okay, so in this video we, we gained a bit more understanding of discriminant functions, specifically focused on generalized linear models, and went over the se several components that you see. So the direction of, uh, so the orientation of the decision surface, the distance of the surface away from the origin, and y of k could be interpreted as the distance of a point to my uh, decision surface. Now, what I'm going to do in the next videos, I'm going to give some examples of discriminant functions.